So I'm going to take a look at this telescope that I bought recently from Walmart. It's a Celestron Astromaster LT70AZ telescope. You will not believe how cheap I paid for this telescope. I'm amazed they can they can make it this cheap. And here's my receipt showing the $78 when I bought it January 21st of 22. And here we see the new price of $55 when I was back at Walmart on February the 4th of 2022. So I took back the, uh, I used my receipt with the $78 and returned it uh, for the $55. Now the following various prices are going to be from February the 5th of 2022. Here we're taking a look on Walmart's website for that scope. And that is the price that they are showing. Here we see the cost of that same telescope on Amazon. Here we're looking at B&H Photo. Here we see one eBay selling it at $80.64 and another at $109.89. What I want to do next, guys, is before I uh, open up the box, show you what's in it, is uh, on August 19th, 2018, I uploaded to my video, uh, YouTube channel a uh, video entitled what does a $220 telescope give you review of the Mead infinity 102 AZ and to date being February 5th 2022 as I shoot this clip I have 38,710 views and quite a few comments on there and uh, what I want to do is take one of the clips that I used in that video which lasts 3 minutes and 45 seconds and I'm going to insert the same exact clip following this uh, before I do the box opening because I think the information in, in there is very appropriate and um, so that'll follow here and then after that clip which again says last three minutes 45 seconds we will open up the box see what's inside okay when you're ready to buy your first telescope it's best to do your homework always um, if possible go to your local astronomy club and uh, when they have a star party, check out the different designs, be it a reflector, refractor, or catadoptrics, which are the mirror lens system. They have mirror lenses, uh, combinations. And uh, see which one suits your purpose. Um, by looking at them and touching them and talking to people, you'll get a much better idea. And then look at the different manufacturers. Uh, what's the differences between the various ones? Uh, also, you can tell if there's any issues with them by actually looking and touching. And, um, you know, you can read reviews, but sometimes I have to ask myself how honest are reviews in some of these astronomy magazines that um, when those same companies have full-page ads in the front and back, and now they're supposed to get an honest review. So... Always do the research for yourself. And then after using those, you should come to some uh, consensus as to what would suit you. Um, also, before you order a telescope, find out what the return policy is. How long are you able to keep the telescope prior to having to return it? Do you need to have a return authorization number? Because the big thing is you're going to need enough time to evaluate the scope, especially optically. There's only so many days where you have good weather 
So if you're working Monday through Friday, you don't really have time to use it, but uh, you have clear skies. But then on the weekend, it's cloudy and raining, well, you've wasted a week there. So that's important. Find out what the return policy is. Um, and also, uh, remember that everybody's opinions varies. What one person likes, the next may not. So look for yourself. As they say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. When you're checking out these telescopes, is the mount steady, be it a equatorial or Dobsonian? Are the motions smooth or are they jerky? A jerky mount will never, believe me, is very frustrating. Is the focuser smooth in its travel? Um, do When you're focusing in and out, the stars should come to a point. They, they should come to an ex a, a focus. You shouldn't have to go back and forth wondering... Where is the sharpest focus? Uh, do the optics pass a star test? Remember, the lens is the most important part of a telescope. If it is bad, nothing else matters. Also, when you're focusing, does the image shift back and forth? So when you're focusing in and out, the image should not shift. Meaning, you know, back and forth, top to bottom, whatever it may be. It should stay centered, and as you focus... It should come into focus and out of focus, but it shouldn't jump around as you draw as you go in and out. If it does, that means there's an issue with the focusing mechanism. So, and remember, high magnification is useless. So, never buy a telescope that touts, you know, 400 times, you know, see Saturn's rings. Because, first off, you have to have good seeing, good optics, and the if the conditions and optics don't allow, you're never going to be able to use 400 times. So. Uh, just a few things to look at that I feel is important for the novice to do to get the most enjoyment of the telescope that they do get. All right, so let's see what we get inside here. First, we see that we have some literature. Now, as far as instructions, if you're not too familiar with a telescope, if you're a novice or your parents bought you this, as a youngster for your very first telescope, which this telescope pretty much is a, a, a very much beginner's telescope, uh, the quick setup guide may not be enough. You'll have to go to Celestron's website and you can download a full instruction manual in a PDF format. Get a little information here on how you can download Starry Night Celestron Basic Edition. Starry Night is a uh, program on its own, and apparently Celestron uh, had them do a version for themselves. And it gives you the uh, information on how to download it. Information on getting a Sky Portal app. And information on registering your product. You also get a battery. Now this is a 3 volt CR2032. And I believe this battery is for a remote you're getting in there. To uh, operate uh, an app. To be taking pictures with your phone. We'll, we'll double check that. So we've got a real small little box right here in this corner. We're going to look at that next. So here, guys, you see what was in that small box. What we have is a lens cloth. I'm assuming to wipe an eyepiece, your, your, your lens. Uh, something that if you had a good scope, I would never use anything like this. Then you have your Bluetooth remote that, I, that you needed that battery for. And let's see, and, that, and that's to use, let's see what it says here in the manual or the quick start. It's a Bluetooth shutter remote, so that I believe you, you, you use in conjunction with the app. It gives you the small little, looks like a tool of some type. We'll have to see as we go on what that's for. I have that, I had that up against the diagonal. You get a 45 degree diagonal uh, uh, to the, moving more to the right. The next is a 20 millimeter eyepiece. The next is a 10 millimeter eyepiece. Then you have a red dot finder, which uh, instead of an optical finder, you would use this red dot uh, in helping to uh, find objects in the sky. Now they're calling it a star pointer, a red dot finder scope. That's what they call it. 
and then you get a smartphone adapter. That's the last thing that you see on the far right. So here's a close-up of that remote that you get. The, what I will call a multi-purpose tool. Now this is the diagonal. So this would go into the eyepiece end here. Uh, this would go into the draw tube that you see. And your eyepiece would go in here. So now you can look down in here. Instead of having to crane your neck your neck looking straight up through the tube since you know the uh, refractors are straight you'd have to look through it so if, if you were up high in the, in the sky looking at an object you'd have to be whatever that angle is by using this on your telescope as you can see as you increase the angle you're still looking through here so and you know again at the price point of this telescope this is all plastic and very 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 cheap again I don't know how they can give you all this at the price point that I got this at, but that's what you got here. And this is your eyepiece. It's a 20 millimeter. I'll show you later how to figure out the magnification. Looking in the quick start guide, it gives you no information as to the focal length of this telescope. Um, because that's how you would figure out the magnification. You need to have the focal length. They don't give it in the quick start guide, but I'll show you. I'm going to go on Celestron's website, and I'll show you the specs. So in any event, this is the eyepiece. I believe they said it was an apparent 40 degree or 50 degree field of view. Again, at the price point of this telescope, it is very economical. And it looks like it does have a flip-up uh, cap here, or, you know, for... Uh, stray light and it does come with caps now this is a 10 millimeter eyepiece this will give you twice the magnification of the 20 so uh, whatever the focal length of the telescope is using a 20 will give you uh, a set amount for that particular telescope and going to 10 will double that Again, and again, it has the same fold-down feature here for um, stray light. You have a cap for the front and a cap for the back side, as do both eyepieces. And this is their star finder, red dot finder, that they're calling. And you'd pull that, I'm not going to yet, so that it, it would make contact with the battery when you're using it and again a very light small unit and uh, given the again the price point of this telescope I'm amazed they're giving you as much as they are the last item in that small bag is um, the smartphone adapter and um, This looks like a quarter 20 to put on a tripod. Looks like you can adjust the spread of this somehow. Now this is made out of an aluminum. This base piece. Then this appears to all be plastic. But this 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 base big base piece base piece is aluminum I think the next box we'll look at is this front box the shorter of the two uh, long boxes and I believe this will be the telescope because uh, I'm thinking the tripod is going to be the back box but I could be wrong and I was correct guys that next box did in fact include the telescope so I just opened it up and I wanted to see how they had it in here uh, wrapped up.
Now you'll see on the focus around this yellow tag, which warns the uh, person about never attempting to view the sun through any telescope without proper fil filtering. And of course, guys, that should go without saying, but I'm sure an attorney somewhere said you better put that down. And again, never ever look through any optical aid, even with the naked eye, you don't stare at the sun. But especially with any optical aid, which will uh, bring those rays right to a focus, right into your retina, not a good idea. What I want to do next, guys, is we're going to go to Celestron's website before we take out the um, tripod. And we're going to look at some of the specs because, again, the quick start manual does not give you any specs so we'll look at that next. All right, so we're on Celestron's website that has to do with this A, the LT-70AZ telescope. And if you scroll down the page, so you'll see this description, specifications, videos, accessories, and support and downloads. Click on the support and downloads, and then that's where you're gonna see where you can download the actual manual, the, the better manual, that you don't get with the telescope that you see the cursor on here and then of course what you do get is this quick setup guide but you can download both of those as PDF documents and the manual that you download from Celestron is 21 pages versus the couple pages that you get with the quick start guide on page 6 of that manual you'll get a what's in the box I really wish they would have this manual included, but they don't when you buy the scope. Because for those that aren't familiar with telescopes, this will let them know exactly what they're getting. Now I'm already seeing an issue. If we look on Celestron's website under the specifications, we see that it's 70 millimeter diameter or 2.76 inch diameter lens. Focal length is 900 millimeters or 35 inches in F13. That tube length does not support a 35 inch focal length. That has to be wrong. Now if we look on page 13 of the manual that you download, it says the AstroMaster LT70AZ has a focal length of 700 millimeters. That makes sense because 700 millimeters would be an F10 and a, tw a focal length of 27.5 inches and the tube will support that uh, unless they're using some kind of internal lenses or something I'll have to take a look at that so but you're you're already getting two two different focal lengths 900 on their website and 700 here because then they even show that uh, you're gonna get 35 times with the 20 millimeter eyepiece because you would divide 20 into the 700 now I want to delve a little further into that focal length issue because uh, if we say 70 millimeter diameter times 10, F10, that gives us 700, which the one was showing. Divide that by 25.4, you get 27 and a half inches as the overall length or the optical train, the optical path would be about, give or take here, 27 and a half inches. Now I've got the draw tube all the way out. This doesn't take into account if you put your diagonal on, which changes the the length effectively from you know the diagonal that you'd put in there. But this is all the way out. And if we take a look, the objective lens is right about here. This is the dew shield. The objective is back here. So if I come in here and here's 20, where my thumb is is 27 inches. So when we put that there, you can clearly see that this supports a 27-inch focal length, an F10. Okay, no way does it support a 35, because here's 35, I've got to go way over here. I mean, it, it just doesn't support the 900 millimeter focal length, so not quite sure what's going on. And I hadn't looked at this earlier, but you look at the box and it just it shows the two eyepieces, giving 35 and 70. So 700 millimeters is the correct focal length. The website is wrong on Celestron's. 
Now we're we are uh, still on Celestron's website, and it says 70 millimeter refractor telescope with fully coated glass optics and a lightweight frame. Well, I think what they mean by lightweight frame is plastic, and it actually has what they're calling a fully coated glass optic. Now, what they mean by fully coated is left to one's speculation. Is it the front and back surface? Is it the all? Is it just the air to glass surfaces, or is it every surface of the glass? I'm assuming it's a doublet. It's at least a doublet. And are all four surfaces then coated? That I don't know. Next, we will take a look at that very last box, which is the tripod. This is going to be what they call their accessory tray. Goes in the center of the tripod. Here you see the tripod out of its packaging. Starting down at the feet, this is all plastic. We've got some metal legs. The center spread spreader is all plastic. The handle end is plastic. This is metal. The uh, connector at the top of your tripod leg is plastic. The tripod head is an aluminum. And then this is where the dovetail of your telescope would go in. And I see they have a little small piece of like nylon on the end of there to grip the dovetail plate of the telescope, which is built into the telescope. All right, guys, now we're going to take a close look at the telescope. Now, upon inspection, down at the tailpiece of the telescope, which would be by the focuser, you clearly see... And it says the diameter is 70 millimeters. The focal length is 700, which gives a focal ratio of f10, which is exactly what I thought. Uh, as I showed previously, just by looking at the length of the tube. And the model number is 22109-DS, made in China. Alright, so let's examine this telescope, starting down at the eyepiece end. Obviously, at this price point, everything is plastic. Uh, this is all plastic here. Uh, this is plastic. Uh, I think, and I have to double check, I think this is where the red dot finder goes on here. And obviously, everything else, plastic. I mean, you're not, I mean, you know, for the price, I'm amazed that you even get this much. It truly is amazing. Now, this is a rack and pinion, which means... See the rack? The pinion's inside here. There's your rack. Now, it does have grease on it. So, you want to be real careful, especially at night. You don't want to get that on your hands. It'll get everywhere else you touch, anything, eyepieces. So, just be real careful. All your modern high-end telescopes have what they call greaseless focusers. But again, but I just point this out because you want to be real careful now. Okay, because that will make a heck of a mess now here I've got it all the way drawn out the tube is out as far as it'll go now the total travel of that draw tube if I measure from the point where it stops is right about four and one eighth inches Okay, as we move forward towards the lens, the tube itself is plastic. It does have an aluminum dovetail that's on here. And it also has some quarter 20 tapped holes, it looks like, so that you can attach that to a tripod head should you want to. Otherwise, when you use the alt as mount that they give you, you'll use this dovetail here. Next, we go down towards the end of the telescope tube or the objective ends, your lens being in here. Now, this doesn't come apart. This is all one solid tube. Nothing can be taken apart. Okay. 
and then this is your your cap again everything here is 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 plastic now this ring rotates I'm not sure that ring rotates but nothing you can't unscrew anything it's just that ring that's over there possibly just a beauty ring the beauty ring that they put on there for some reason okay but that doesn't do anything and then we have at the end your lens cap again plastic and down inside you'll see the lens so now we're looking down into the objective lens as you see there and you can see one of the foil spacers I'm gonna assume it's a spacer you see that right there uh, right now it's in approximately the center of the field of view that you see on the edge of that lens I think that there's three of those in there there's the other one that one's easier to see right there then you have one at the bottom you can see it right there so you're looking down into what they're calling a glass lens just phenomenal at the price I really really am amazed that Walmart had it for fifty five dollars I mean that they were selling it even 78 it's just it's crazy how you can get a a functioning telescope we'll see how well it functions for such low prices all right guys so that does it for now we're in the dead of winter here it's extremely cold out I'm gonna wait till it warms up then we will put we will put this together put it through its paces and check this out and see what I think about this telescope okay guys so today is Saturday March 5th 2022 it turned out to be a beautiful morning it's gonna be a beautiful day it's supposed to get up near 70 here so what I thought I'd do is get out this telescope then and let's start with the tripod to uh, extend the legs you've got this knob back here triangular shaped knob which allows the leg to be extended to whatever you want tighten it now make sure these things are secure you don't want them falling over and you can see that the feet have a spike uh, built into them the next thing you're going to want to do before you put any scope on this is on these on these spreader arms you're going to want to put the tray on which also acts to keep this from moving up and down like this so you'll see that there's 120 degree spacing here these little tabs you'll line those tabs up like that and then simply rotate it and then you'll see that these locking they have these little locking things just turn it like that the approximate height if we measure from here down to the ground is 44 inches Let's take a look at some of the controls of this tripod this knob we see here controls the azimuth adjustment which is your panning around the horizon from north east south west and then back to north that's your azimuth and then to lock it in place simply just like that and we're locked in place next is the altitude adjustment which is controlled by this long arm here you would loosen that up and now the altitude of your scope in the sky can be positioned and then just turning this clockwise will lock it down and the one other thing to look at is this particular knob which is what will hold your telescope and you'll notice it's got a uh, built-in nylon tip so that will then when you're locking this down to the dovetail that will lock onto the dovetail let's look at the smoothness of the controls first 
we're going to take a look at the azimuth. We're locked down. So let's give it a couple revolutions. And without anything on it, okay, we're just going to turn this. Now it's stiff. And you'll notice the movement in the tripod. You do have this Allen head where you could probably loosen that up and try to make it a little bit smoother. That will require a six millimeter Allen wrench. So now I'm going to set this upright and do all my adjusting with it setting up, but I wanted to show you how that would loosen. Now, when we do that, you'll see that this now wiggles on that base. So we've got to tighten that up. We can't leave it like that. That's not good either. Now I've tightened that a little bit more. Now the wiggling that you're getting is inherent in just the the tripod not being that rigid so I will say that is smoother I'm gonna leave it just like that so if you want to adjust it to your liking because again before it was real jerky this way here as you can see it's much smoother and you definitely don't want that to jerk around when you're trying to do minute changes in azimuth. Because being out as, you're going to need to go in two directions as the uh, stars and planets move in the sky with the rotation of the Earth. You're going to need to pan in azimuth and altitude. And you want both motions to be smooth. So I think we got it right here, guys. Looking at the motion and altitude, I have found that I have to go almost one full revolution of this handle before it actually gets smooth. So let's rotate this. We're locked. And then it also depends how tight you tighten this. So let me put my finger here. That's half a revolution. And that's not bad. A little jerky. And then we're going to come up. This is a full revolution. Now, I'm not going to do it, but I believe that these caps pull off. And I'm sure that there's going to be an adjustment here that I can loosen or tighten. Just get a small screwdriver here and pull that off. And I think all you got to do then is adjust this. Now we're going to mount the telescope tube and we're going to want to back this locking knob off so that the tube can go into the dovetail. I think that should do it. And you're going to want to just put this like this, slide it up. A little, there we go. And then just lock this down. Now you may have to do a further adjustment once you put the eyepiece in because you want to make sure that's kind of balanced somewhat. So this looks pretty good. Yeah, looks like centered does pretty well because this isn't a very heavy scope to begin with and you're going to have control of this. But that's what this would allow. You can slide it back and forth if one end or the other seems to dip a little bit too much for you, just slide it. And then that way you'll be able to balance it better in the altitude axis.
Now, as you can see here, this scope will not reach full altitude to the zenith because it is hitting right here. Another thing you've got to look out for is this handle is going to be, depending on where you're looking, if you don't rotate this tripod all the time, this handle is going to hit the tripod leg. So see, as we move it like this, then we have the issue of it hitting back here, like I showed previous. And then if you come here, you're going to hit this. So once you choose a target in the sky, you're going to need to make sure your tripod legs are not in the way and you'll have to physically rotate the tripod around to accommodate that. Now here's another way around that issue, although there's still a practical limit as to how close to the zenith you're going to get. If you take the telescope, and this won't be as convenient to the observer because you're going to have to reach around to the front to lock this, but if you were to put the uh, locking handle towards the objective end and away from you, you will get more altitude and you will be able to observe objects higher in the sky. Again, at the loss of convenience, because now you've got to reach around. Let me hold this. Now you've got to reach around. So you're in front of the scope like this. Like that. You're in front of the scope like this. And you've got to reach around and lock it. Not a very easy task. Especially when you're doing this at night and bumping things and you hit, you run the high risk of moving off your object. Especially when you start to use higher powers. That's going to be critical. Now let's look at the focuser end. This actually, the focuser has a pretty nice amount of drag on it. It's not bad at all. I like that. It's not loose and it's not tight. To me it's got just the right amount of drag which is the friction on that draw tube. Next we're going to put in an accessory here to the eyepiece holder. We're going to put the diagonal in first. We'll pull the caps on both the eyepiece end here and on the diagonal. Now you've got two locking screws. Put that in there and then tighten it down. Now you don't want to use a lot of, a lot of friction there. You don't want it too tight because this is just plastic right here. So you don't want to strip that. And the reason I'm putting the diagonal on is because most of your observing is going to be with this diagonal. If you're doing something terrestrial and you're looking straight on the horizon, say at, at, at uh, a lake or at, at something on the horizon or straight ahead of you, uh, parallel to the ground, you may want to go without this and just put the eyepiece in. But for astronomical use, you will be using the diagonal. It's going to be so much easier when this telescope is pointed like this up in the air you want your eye looking down you don't want to be down on the ground looking up this way it's so much more comfortable looking down either seated seating or standing this is the way you want it next we're going to put an eyepiece in they give you two eyepieces a 10 and a 20 we're going to go with a 20 I highly recommend if you are not familiar with a telescope and this is a very beginner telescope do not use high powers always start out with your 20 millimeter get used to the telescope I cannot say that enough get used to the telescope high powers are useless if you don't know what you're doing if you're not familiar with the telescope use the 20 millimeter that's the lowest power they have and you can pull the caps off and you're ready to do some observing let's take a quick look at that accessory tray there that's really nice because you can put all your caps there, your eyepieces. You could even, even set your eyeglasses on there if you want to. Keep everything off the ground from getting lost. One thing you do want to be careful of is high winds. You probably won't be observing when it's too windy, but you don't want your caps and stuff blowing away. I've actually had issues like that with some other equipment. Uh, so just something to look out for. One thing I want to point out is that 
when I adjusted this altitude underneath there earlier, I find I don't even have to lock this. In fact, there's no need to lock this all the time. I leave this loose, and you can pan very nicely. So I think that one of the big things you're going to want to do is make sure this isn't that this uh, azimuth adjustment is nice and smooth like you're seeing here because from the fact it was very snug and, and useless so now we really made this look good I mean it's really working good and the only other thing you're going to have to loosen and adjust each time is going to be your altitude one less thing to worry about so I think you'll be fine by just not locking that down all the time so I'm looking at something on the horizon. This is the 20 millimeter, which with this telescope is going to give you 35 times. I wish they would give you a longer focal length, like maybe 25 or 30, because this eyepiece design is not wide at all. Now, I'm not sure how well this will capture with this camera, what I'm looking at on the horizon, but there we go might be close kind of hard to do now you we're getting heat waves so we can't really uh, worry about the heat waves we're getting off of the uh, from the Sun today now one thing you notice there is that the house was properly uh, positioned it wasn't right to left top to bottom so this is an erecting prism down here which for astronomical use you can use light and depending on the quality and again with this scope this is going to be of the minimalist quality but just to point out that when you look at something the images will be properly from uh, top to bottom left to right normally in an astronomical scope that's not a worry and so that's not something that they uh, worry about or do now I do have for my other uh, equipment erecting prisms that I use just for terrestrial use but when it comes to astronomical observation I never use them another thing I've just tried guys is on your altitude I just tighten it just enough to see where the scope and since this is an extremely light scope and I've got it centered on here I'm able to actually not have to tighten it all the time now it's not real real smooth in all motions but it will suffice in having to tighten that all the time. Now with that 20 millimeter eyepiece, I wanted to see if this could reach focus without the diagonal, and it does. We're focused at infinity, so that diagonal, should you want, you can go straight through. You don't need any extension tubes or anything else. And one thing to remember now, the diagonal being an erecting prism, we are now upside down. Now I'm going to attempt to show you that. We're looking in the eyepiece. There's that same house, right? It is upside down. Something you want to look out for when you are taking out an eyepiece, the diagonal, whatever, in this draw tube of the focuser, you want to be real careful because these screws in here are very small and you don't want to drop those at night so be careful how far you're pulling those out okay I'm going to be putting that 10 millimeter eyepiece in and seeing what it looks like here during the daytime something I want to show you is we put that out now this is plastic obviously you're not going to get uh, aluminum or anything like that but now watch what happens when I tighten this down take a look at the interface between this and the eyepiece here watch what happens you see that gap opening now let me loosen it tighten it that's because it's plastic and in a scope like this at, the, at this extreme price point you wouldn't expect anything else but again this is a amateur scope a beginner scope 
Uh, I can't stress enough that this is a beginner telescope. And I would further say more for a child, a youngster, let's say. Now here's that house at 70 times with the 10 millimeter eyepiece. And I know it's kind of shaky here because I'm holding the uh, camera and trying to move this along to kind of see what we got there. Now with that 20 millimeter eyepiece, I can observe with my glasses on and see the entire field of view. So it's got a decent eye relief. With this 10 millimeter, I cannot do that. I absolutely have to take my glasses off. The eye relief is, is very bad on this one if you wear glasses. You will need to take them off. Here you see the red dot finder attached. And what you need to do is you've got these two bolt heads. You'd loosen that up so that that dovetail that you see there fits in with the dovetail on here. Slide it on there and then tighten those two screws up to keep that attached. So let's take a look at some of the adjustments on this red light finder. So I'm glad they did this. They've got two dots. When those dots line up, it is turned off. And you, as soon as you come off that, it's on, and it's got a nice click stop there. So if you see that, you know that it's on until you turn it off like that. Up front is your battery. Just pull that cover off, and there's your battery. Let's take a look at the button in the back that we haven't taken a look at yet, this one here. What that does, if we take a look here, when you're adjusting this, what you would do is you would center something on your scope uh, in the eyepiece. Then you would take the red dot and you'd want to make sure that it is centered on the object that you're looking at. So to accomplish that, this allows the up and down. So now watch what happens when I turn this. See how that's going down, which would raise the front. Then if I go the opposite direction, it pulls it up, push, puts, pushes it up, which will lower the front. And your red dot thing is in there. So that's what that accomplishes. So let's see what this knob up front does. If we turn it, Watch the gap on both either side there. You'll see the gap close up on your right and open up on the left. Turn it in the other direction, it'll do the opposite. It'll open it up on the right and close on the left. So what that's doing is your side to side of this red dot finder. So with those two knobs, you're able to go up and down and side to side so that when you uh, aim this at an object, it should be near the field of view of your eyepiece. So let's take a look at that. We're going to turn this on. It might be a little hard to see in the daytime, but you see that red dot back there? That's at full brightness. And then we can turn it down to adjust the brightness that we want at night from full, full off to full brightness and again if it was dark you'd be able to see the fainter the faintness of that but right now since it's it's brighter you'll see that we can only it will only show up well when it's turned to the brightest setting what that does it projects that beam from here onto the screen and that's what you would use to visually eye up your object from when that dot is on the uh, object in question that you want to observe. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is wait for night to fall. I don't know that tonight's going to work out. They're saying that even though it's beautiful now, 
that it's supposed to cloud up later and uh, get much windier and possible rain. So the next clear night that I get, I will take this out and we will see how this performs under the stars. Kind of hard to do this guys, but trying to look at the, it's not really showing up very well in my camera. There's the terminator line. I'm just holding my camera up to the eyepiece. I'm using the 20 millimeter. And I'm trying to move it along, but because of the jerkiness of this mount, that's why it's shaking. I can't have the mount too loose or it won't. It'll flop around. So... And today is uh, March 10th. 2022 approximately 9 p.m. and I do want to mention something that I talked about and that is how this handle can hit the tripod here you see where the moon is um, that last clip I showed the moon and you can see how close this is to the tripod so basically it was almost impossible to if it was any higher you would not be able to see the moon and it's at a very high altitude so it's about a first quarter moon. So again, just to show you that at certain times, this scope will be very hard to use when objects are at a high altitude. And that's just inherent in the uh, mount itself. And as I stated, what you could do, it would be a little bit inconvenient, but what you can do is then take this tube, have the handle up in front of the tube like I showed you could do that alright there's that moon again I wanted to try it it's actually not too bad there is there is false color around the limb but as you can see there is uh, much detail along the terminator line with the craters now this is with the 10 millimeter eyepiece And again, guys, I'm just holding this up to the uh, eyepiece. Still with the 10 millimeter eyepiece, you can see some false color on it. There's the limb of the moon. Okay, this is not going to show up well at all. 
because this camera that I'm using isn't going to autofocus. This is on the Star Cirrus, and unfortunately, it's not going to do well. But as anticipated, it uh, looks like the rainbow. I mean, there's just a multitude of colors on the very brightest stars like this, which, which with this kind of scope would be expected. And again, the, the camera that I'm using, this point and shoot, is not autofocusing right on that. It did the moon, but not this. So, one other thing while I'm at it, uh, with a telescope. It takes time for the optics to cool down. Now this won't take a whole lot of time, but you don't want to bring it in from a hot, warm house in the winter and take it right outside and expect it to give you, um, you know, the best images. Uh, same thing with the summer, you know. I, uh, the best thing would be if, is if you could take it outside for about an hour, 30 minutes, 60 minutes prior to observing and let the objective lens acclimate to the temperatures or if you uh, could or put it in the garage um, that would help but I just thought I'd point that out so what are my thoughts on this telescope I think it'd be a great scope for a youngster somebody just starting out uh, a parent could buy this and not have to worry about spending a lot of money if you can get this for around a hundred dollars or so I think it's a great deal a great starter scope it's got decent aperture 70 millimeters and uh, I first started out years ago with a uh, 60 millimeter Tasco and that kept me happy for years so I think this would be a great scope for, for youngsters I don't know that this would be something an adult wants to use that's my opinion again with the mead scope that I tested, the downside is going to be the mount. And I didn't even try this telescope with the um, 10 millimeter on the stars. Just too hard to keep track of them, moving it around and jerking it around. The moon is a larger object, easier to do. I just used a uh, 20 millimeter eyepiece. And uh, so I think for the price, you can't go wrong. And for a youngster, Unless you just literally abuse this telescope, it stays collimated and it's easy to pick up, grab and go. You can take it with you camping, take it somewhere, take it out in the yard. Requires minimum amount of uh, acclimation to temperatures. Um, so that's what I think about this telescope. And I was surprised at the really decent views it gave of the moon and uh, some other stellar objects.